make too much of a difference to us. That seems to be the general feeling of many of the English people faced with the prospect of Scottish independence, according to a Newsnight opinion poll. Our poll questioned English voters and almost half, 48%, were against Scottish independence with 36% in favour. That's about the same level of support for cutting the tie as recent polls north of the border. Nonetheless, it is a significant increase in support in England. When we asked a similar question four years ago, only 16% backed an independent Scotland. But if the Scots choose to go it alone, the English may not be too upset. When asked if Scotland was to become independent, would England be better or worse off? Most, 51%, didn't think it would make much difference. 19% thought England would be better off, 21% said worse off. The remainder didn't know. And when asked if they wanted a UK-wide referendum to ratify any Scottish bid for independence, although the vote was split, 45% said yes, they would like a say. Well, the question of Scottish independence has become a whole lot more urgent since the Scots Nationalists took control of the Parliament in Holyrood. They promise a referendum on independence. No one is offering the English a vote on whether 300 years of union should be chucked in the bin. Well, we're going to talk uh, further about whether Britain has a future shortly. But first we asked Alan Little what he thought was behind the rise of Scottish nationalism. <laughs> Even they seem dumbfounded by the scale of their victory, its game-changing potential. Fifty years ago, the SNP polled less than 1% of the popular vote. What has happened in Scotland in the course of my own lifetime to turn them into the dominant force, one that is changing the political landscape of Scotland? This party, the Scottish party, the National Party, carries your hope and we shall carry it carefully. In the Scotland I grew up in, the British state was a very concrete presence. It dug coal, milled steel, built ships, manufactured motor cars. It put the gas and electricity and the phone into your home. The state probably even owned the house you lived in. In the 80s, all that changed. Scottish industry was swept away. Something of the shared experience of Britishness was swept away with it. Coal mining now belongs to the museum services. It is something we learn that our forebears once did. This is the mining museum at Newton Grange near Edinburgh. The miners of Fife and the Lothians were part of a shared community of interest with miners in Nottinghamshire and Yorkshire and South Wales. They told the same narrative history of struggle and social progress. They fought the same fights against the same enemies. They shared the same pantheon of folk heroes and labour leaders. It was a very pan-British enterprise. Their tradition was one of the bedrocks of British identity in Scotland. And it's gone. And with every year that passes, it recedes further and further into a now distant collective memory. This is not so much the rise of a new Scottish sentiment, it's more the gradual decay of much of what it once meant to be British in Scotland. After the Second World War, um, the Union uh, between Scotland and England really meant something. It's probably the closest the two nations have been since the Act of Union in 1707. There had just been this great war against the common enemy of fascism. Um, the National Health Service was being established, this great creation of the post-war Labour governments. And socialism itself, if you like, was a great integrative force. Then along comes uh, Thatcherism, uh, decline of the trade unions, uh, socialism disappears, the state is not the same. Uh, as it was, and the ties that bind, bound became gradually loosened. Loyalty to the idea of the British Union is written into the street names of Scotland. To pre-war generations, the Union meant the great shared enterprise of empire. But that's long gone too. So what is left of Britishness? Queen remains very important. The army uh, and all that kind of thing is, is, is important. But I think at the heart, the thing that most Scots still feel in the depth of their being is that Britain, a United Kingdom, offers them economic security. And I think the experience of our two main banks collapsing has really brought that home to people. I think people think, hang on, if Scotland had been independent around that time, who would have bailed out our banks? 
would we be in the same situation as Ireland or, or Iceland? Pro-union politicians should be careful with this line of argument. Many Scots remember being warned that even devolution would bring economic disaster. It didn't. Oil has made Aberdeen the second richest city in Britain. Unemployment in Aberdeenshire is less than 2%. There is evidence that many Scots no longer respond well to being told that they couldn't possibly survive alone. Alex Salmon made a rod for his own back a few years ago when he argued that an independent Scotland would be part of some kind of arc of prosperity that took in Ireland and Iceland. Well, we don't hear much of that argument anymore. Even so, many Scottish people look across the North Sea here to a constellation of small countries, comparable population to Scotland, also on the northern periphery of Europe, Finland, Norway, Denmark, which prosper. And they ask, if they can do it, why can't we? Is there really something inherent in the nature of Scotland that makes it uniquely unable to pay its own way? There is a well-entrenched popular perception of the Scots as unproductive subsidy junkies, bailed out year after year by their beneficent southern neighbours. But what do the Treasury figures reveal? Um, in 2008-9, which is when we have the last full numbers, in that year, 59 billion was spent on public expenditure and 43 billion came in by way of revenue. So that gap between, the, between those two figures, mm -hmm. it, can you express it in, as a percentage of GDP? Um, in GDP terms, between about 2005 and 2008, um, if you were to, in, th th that didn't include North Sea oil revenues, um, I should caution. Um, if you did include North Sea oil revenues, and clearly that's a, a, a point for debate, um, then the percentage of GDP ranges from um, around 1.6 to 2.3 per cent. So when you include oil revenue from Scottish waters, Scotland's budget deficit is not very different to that of the UK, fairly normal by European standards. And when the price of oil rises, Scotland's deficit falls below the UK's. Two things Scotland's got no shortage of are these wide open spaces with almost nobody living on them, and you just have to stand here for a few minutes to feel the huge potential of it. Alex Salmon's ambition is to turn Scotland carbon neutral by 2020. He talks about a post-oil future in which an independent Scotland would be what he calls the Saudi Arabia of renewable energy. The question is, is it more achievable inside or outside the United Kingdom? This is Mackey's ice cream, carbon neutral confectionery. 10 million litres of it a year, all made in Aberdeenshire and all powered by the wind on the hill. The whole process from udder to tub. Mac Mackey is the boss. He has three wind turbines. They power his factory and he sells excess electricity to the national grid. On balance over a year, we produce more electricity on site than we actually use. So we're, from that point of view, carbon neutral. It's a huge opportunity for Scotland. Scotland is the windiest country in Europe um, and the UK as a whole is a big electricity user. So the, that's, that's why Scotland can become 100% renewable by 2020, which is the, the SNP plan. Um, I think we can do that. And herein lies a problem for Alex Salmond. Many Scots support him in his drive to carbon neutrality and in many other things without seeing why they need to leave the United Kingdom to do it. When the Scottish Parliament was set up more than a decade ago, the sky didn't fall in, businesses did not run away to England, there was no flight of capital. It quickly established itself as the pretty much undisputed focus of political domestic life in Scotland. But there is something odd about this Parliament, something lopsided. It's the only national legislature that I can think of that's responsible for spending public money but has no corresponding duty to raise it through taxation. And a consensus has formed among all the major parties here that that's got to change. And it's about to. Westminster is planning to transfer some responsibility for tax to Holyrood soon. The Scottish Parliament is getting more powerful. 
and an intriguing new idea is gaining traction, something they're calling Devolution Max, or Independence Light. Um, the SNP has been uh, talking about independence in a very different way to the way it has been traditionally conceived. For a start, they accept that uh, for the time being, at any rate, Scotland would retain the pound sterling, therefore there would be the Bank of England would be control of interest rates, so a lot of economic policy would still uh, exist uh, south of the border. There's also talk of using the UK diplomatic corps, uh, the UK embassies abroad, perhaps having a unified command structure in the army, though of course they would remove Trident and various other ways in which what they call a new social union w would replace uh, the old UK. The audience request is for coming, so something being done to you. I went to an agricultural fair in the constituency of Murray. They're farming folk. In England, this would be natural Tory territory. Here, they vote SNP. But that doesn't mean they'll vote for independence. I don't want to go independent. And I look at Norway, which has given an example, and the cost of living in Norway has soared at the same population as Scotland, but uh, no, I would rather be with the United Kingdom. Did you vote for the SNP? Yes, I did. Does that mean you want independence for Scotland? No, I don't no. say no. I don't, want I don't think that would be a good thing no, for Scotland. No. Why not? No. I think we need to be united. Stay where we are, keep in close contact with Westminster, but uh, remain semi-independent. But look what happens when you go further down the age demographic. What do you do for a living? I'm a lambing shepherd. Does the fact that you voted the SNP mean you want independence? Yes, I think that is probably the way forward for Scotland. The debate in Scotland is no longer about whether independence is feasible, it's about whether it's desirable. For independence no longer means a repudiation of all that is British. It no longer means separation in any meaningful sense. And that is the real game changer. Well, with us now is the SNP's Joe McAlpine, a member of the Scottish Parliament, Peter Davis, the Mayor of Doncaster and one of a handful of elected officials from the English Democrats Party, and the Conservative MP Rory Stewart, the member for Penrith and the Borders. Um, if this marriage fails, does it matter? I think it matters very deeply. I think we'll miss it terribly. It's something that it's very easy to imagine you can tear apart, but I think like any relationship, any intertwined thing, once it's gone, we'll miss it and we will never forgive the governments that tore it apart. What would we lose? I think it's a mistake to think we lose economics. You can make economic arguments, you can make political arguments, you lose an idea, an idea of union, an idea of what was great about Britain, of England, mm. of Scotland, and those are things that all of us feel. Joe McAlpine, is there any benefit in this uh, separation to the English? Is there any benefit to the English? Not that you necessarily care. <laughs> I care okay, very deeply about the English. I'm quite an Anglophile myself. I think uh, the English, uh, the English in your own book, I think you mentioned, Jeremy, on, on the English, that the English, uh, English identity has been rather suppressed by British identity. Uh, whereas Scots had a dual identity through the age of the Empire, uh, the English weren't really allowed to express many of their traditions, their radical interests. So it English would free the, the English, you think? In I a think way. it would free the English to Do have a different would kind be lost? of um, nationalism. Would anything be lost? Would anything be lost? No, because I think we'd continue to have a very strong social union. We'd still have the Queen as head of state. We'd still have uh, a lot of cross-border uh, cooperation. Uh, this is part of a process. It's not a. It's not a divorce. It's not a breakup. It's actually about Scotland joining in. Uh, as an English Democrat, uh, would you worry? Could I be a Scotophile? Is it be is whatever you like? Me? Well, I am. But anyway, okay. Would we what? Do you care if the Scots decide to go their own? Not way? now. I think if we turn the clock back, I would like to go back to the status quo ante. Uh, before the devolution settlement. Oh, I thought uh, it came back to 1700. No, 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 no. It, the, the devolution affair was a total mistake on the part of the Labour government. It was done to shore up their own support in Scotland and Wales. They thought they'd be in power there forever and a day, and clearly that has not been the case. The losers in that devolution affair were the English. Well, if I, could into, if, I could intervene, if I could intervene... We, we got no parliament. If I could intervene there, the, the reason for the Scottish Parliament was because there had been a very, very long campaign within Scotland for a, a Parliament that allowed a, a democratic expression for mistake? Scotland. No, 
I think probably in the end it reflected desires for the Scottish people 